Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partner in soccer on this Thursday morning. That is David Goss, and we have a new partner in soccer on loan with a pr- option to buy, maybe? I don't know. Joe Lowry of Backheeled and the Total Soccer Show is with us. Joe, it's not a tryout, but we really liked your uh, technical ability from afar. We think you can fit in with this podcast, so we're happy to have you aboard. I, I hope these are all podcast references because Goss has seen me play soccer. He knows that my technical ability doesn't look good up close or far away. So uh, either way, I appreciate you guys having me. This is going to be fun. Yes, I would like to pick a bone with you before we get to this very special mailbag show. And I, I have a quote from one Joe Lowry. And that quote, which I hear twice a week now and I heard every single day during the World Cup was, just because soccer games are 90 minutes long, doesn't mean that soccer podcasts have to be, and you don't have to say soccer podcast, Joe. You can just say extra time. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be if, if I had a voice as sultry and smooth as yours, I would go on for ninety minutes. When I'm when I'm stuck with my voice and uh, me, that's that stuff's coming in for. Yeah, I know. I went in. That feels long. like a list yeah. reference, yeah. From Joe. Right? Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. That feels like a, like an undercut once again, like a compliment that's not really one. There's there's the ultimate takeaway here, guys. Is there's room in, in the landscape for all this stuff. If you want to get in and out in, in ten minutes or so on a commute or whatever it is hopefully your commute's 10 minutes or less that's a pretty good spot to be in but uh if, if you want a longer thing you had a longer commute there's there's stuff out there for that too so i think i think we can check all these boxes between the two of us all right so we have a detente here between extra time and the back healed show uh but go check it out i was listening to jordan angeli this morning around the breakfast table it was a hit in my mind it was not a hit in my kids mind they wanted the johnny <laughs> songs quote unquote from sing two i don't know if that's gonna land as a reference among the two of you? No? Yes? No? Seems not. Yeah. No. Okay. Maybe some of you at home will understand, quote unquote, the Johnny songs from Sing 2. They're omnipresent in our household these days. Uh, we got a mailbag show for you today. We're recording on Wednesday, which is a new thing for us, but it's going to be permanent going forward. We will be back in the studio together very, very soon with some staff changes. We'll talk to you about those as they happen. But we're going to start recording Wednesdays and releasing Thursday morning. We think that's going to give you more time to consume a 90-minute soccer podcast potentially by getting you uh, two work days, basically, or two commuting days, however you want to look at it, uh, by putting it out Thursday midday, probably. And we're going to make it a mailbag show. We've been thinking about this for a long, long time. We like doing season previews and and game previews and looking ahead, but sometimes we just want to go off on a path that's a little bit uncharted or not timely, or just what we want to talk about on that day, and we would love to have you guide us. So this is going to be the first of many uh, Thursday morning mailbag shows. I'll put out a tweet, as I always do, Andrew underscore Weeby on Twitter. Anything, literally anything. I've had people ask me about my favorite sandwich condiment, of course, anything related to MLS or the U.S. national team or Canadian national team, North American soccer, yada, yada, yada. Um, Hit us up. We're there for you. By the way, MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. Hope you opened, uh, enjoyed Match Day 1. MLS 360 is free to watch. You do not have to subscribe. Of course, we would recommend you subscribe. You can watch any game you want from wherever you want on any device. Six matches are also free every Match Day. This week, Match Day 2, LAFC Portland, Columbus DC, Miami Philly, Red Bulls Nashville, Chicago NYCFC, and San Jose Vancouver are those matches. We're going to talk about the game that we're looking forward to most, including some of those. We're going to talk about a hypothetical one-for-one trades around the league. We're going to dig into uh, uh, Joe here's Goss Theorem Player of the Year because we've already given ours. Talk Kip Keller and the Austin possibilities at center back and so much more on this show. But we start with an open question for you, Joe, and all of us from Ali, Tacticality on Twitter. What's the moment that got you into soccer? Big, Mm. broad, all-encompassing. Take us away. Okay, I'll I'll lead us off here. My my moment is not I would wager quite as far back as some other folks, but I believe I believe this is etched in stone in my head as the 2014 World Cup. It is Robert Van Persie diving header against Spain at the World Cup. Actually, sort of in a roundabout way, was in Spain at the time watching that game and hearing from the apartments of people around sort of where we're staying. Everybody erupt in like anguish in that moment was. Incredible. And I don't think I'll ever forget being there in that moment. It was just sort of like a happenstance kind of thing. I was always a, a sports guy, but that was the one that I was like, man, there is there's something special here. The international tournaments caught me first, still have a, a big soft spot for that side of the game. And then kind of grew into a lot of the club stuff from that diving header. 
how did you get like well you get hooked you have this moment yeah, and what happens yeah. afterwards well <laughs> you just oh, like for, hit the internet you just start like you're immediately a member of soccer twitter you can't go from <laughs> zero to you can't go from zero to sicko joe like no it's true it, t- it takes a little bit of time for me it was like i'd always the, the thing about sports that always got me was the strategy side which i think probably still comes across in a lot of the stuff i do now so it was going on reading articles finding people uh I mean, should we drop them this early in the show? Like going and, and reading, reading Doyle stuff, like all that, all that kind of stuff really started to influence how I thought about all of this. And then probably the soccer Twitter step came a little bit after that. You got to be like real sure that this is a step you want to take before you <laughs> hop in on soccer Twitter. Like this is not something to be taken lightly, especially U.S. men's national team Twitter. But uh, you know what? I'm, I feel I feel good about making that jump in my past. It's not a hobby. It's a lifestyle, right? Right, right. Yeah, with Doyle, I mean, with Ricky Pooch becoming a DP, Doyle's going to be just absolutely insufferable all the time. Yes, you, indeed. If you're watching on Apple TV or YouTube, you did just get armchaired. Uh, Dave, how about you, man? I Obviously, Joe's more concise than we will both be because of his short pods. Um, I don't know that I have a specific moment. I started playing around 2002, uh, and that's the first time I ever thought about soccer past um, just – knowing people that played it i never old, watched 2002 it. how old were you i was 12 11 or 12 so it yes. feels like given your um i feel that feels like later than i thought it would be for you having yeah i was not i didn't grow up in a soccer family no one cared about it in my life until i got into it hmm. um and i randomly ended up on a team because they didn't have enough players and i was athletic and they put me on the team and then pretty quickly my coach sort of gave me names of people to watch to learn about the game and and Bob teams Bradley to watch. Style. Let's go. Huh? <laughs> Bob Bradley style. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Busquets probably would have been on the list now, but it, <laughs> at the time it was Patrick Vieira. So it started with Arsenal and then I can specifically remember watching Henri score goals. And then in the summer of 04, I went to an FC Porto Galatasaray friendly at giant stadium which porto had just won champions league under Mourinho, uh and that was like the first soccer game i can outside of the rough riders which we went to for birthdays on long island that's the first pro game i remember going to and then from there it was the u.s national team i can vividly remember watching eddie johnson score in 06 world cup qualifying and i'm pretty sure it was the first game against trinidad and tobago and that got me into the u.s which then pulled me back around into mls uh, while I was also sort of learning about European soccer and watching Liga MX and stuff as I sort of started to get into it. So it started with playing um, for me, and then it sort of exploded from there. And I love international competition, similar to what Joe said, on all sports. Like, I watched the Olympics. I stoked about the FIBA World Cup this year. Go Team USA. Uh, and I like rooting for underdogs, but I also like rooting for the U.S., so soccer, there you go, right there. I didn't even know we were going to do this. Fit perfectly for me because it was an underdog, but also I could root for the U.S. and not like feel guilty and bad about it. Uh, and that kind of reverse engineered me into becoming a pretty big fan overall. And then 04, 05 is when I started going to a bunch of Metro Stars games uh, at Giant Stadium, taking the bus from poor to 30, which was gross. So, yeah. Probably still gross. Yeah, I can attest to that. It is still disgusting. <laughs> I cannot imagine that the level of grossness has decreased over the years. I definitely started earlier on the playing side, and I don't. I wasn't from a soccer family either. I think it must have been for my parents. Um, just one of those things where, like, when kids are in that four to six range, you're just sort of throwing them into activities and seeing what sticks. And for me, early on, it was definitely the YMCA. I can I can remember um, the gym. It was indoor. Downtown Wichita YMCA. It was an indoor soccer league. They played with like those foam balls. You know the ones I'm talking about where the outside is sort of that coating, but it all always like peels and flakes off. So you're seeing foam, but then the outside coating. And we had, uh, I can see the YMCA t-shirt like super clearly. You always got two of them. You had the blue one and the white one. So depending on what team you were on. Uh, and that was sort of the start for me. And then I played youth soccer uh, spring and fall throughout my childhood until I uh, well, let's just uh, be perfectly clear. I was a little chunkier in middle school, and I got some plantar fasciitis, and I quit to play baseball full time. Full time because my heels were killing that me. Thing man. kids can get. I got it. So apparently, man. it was short lived. Um, I was okay. I was pretty good. I played a little travel soccer, you know, in grade school and middle school, but uh, ended up making baseball my sport. But then I think, and I think I've told this a number of times. Um, but the 
the 06 World Cup for me, I was a freshman in college, and I didn't have anything to do in the mornings, and all the games were in the morning, so me and my friends would just sit around in Wichita the summer after our freshman year of college and just watch all the games, and I got obsessed. And I, I just remember, like, in particular, outside the U.S., which was the focus, right? Thomas Rosicki, uh, Rosicki and then also Michael Essien, two players that we went up against, and I was like, oh, my God, these dudes are incredible. I went down sort of the internet rabbit hole there, and I remember Yahoo had Eurosport. Do you guys remember Eurosport? Yeah. The website, I think I read literally every possible thing there was to read on Eurosport. And I had a job on the college campus where I could just basically sit in a basement and click around the internet all day long. And that's <laughs> literally what I did. I just messed around on the internet all day long. And through that, eventually, you know, you're talking about the U.S. national team. You get an MLS. And I started watching Fox Soccer Channel all the time and eventually started writing about it for the school newspaper. And ball rolls downhill for... 15 years or so and here we are uh deep deep sicko mode in my basement doing a soccer podcast twice a week i hope ali felt that he was really going to get the full thing because that was the full experience right there yes yes Uh, okay let's get into the games this is from Luis. He says, I think uh, I think an MLS Extra Time Game of the Week is a good idea. Find a game that's not only good football-wise, soccer-wise, Luis, but I'll accept <laughs> it. Nice. Uh, but also from a storytelling perspective. And I want to shout out something that, Joe, you've put together on Backheeled that's really helped me this year and all the prep that I'm doing, both for Extra Time, my columns, as well as MLS Season Pass and the pre- and post-game shows on Countdown and Wrap Up. Backheeled Insights. People may not know what this is. I haven't seen people chattering about this just yet, but I've had access to it and I've been blown away by what you put together. Yeah, so Insights, thanks for the lead-in, Weeby. Insights is a, it's a project that myself and friend of the show, Bobby Warshaw, have been working on for a while now. So the idea is it's a new premium tier on Backyield.com, which is a website that covers all sorts of different avenues of American soccer, but this tier specifically focuses on MLS. So the idea is that we're trying to push the boundary of MLS analysis. So we're talking data, you know, league expertise from, from folks that, you know, are dialed in on this stuff all the time and a bunch of other resources with the ultimate goal of like helping users be sharper. So we've got an MLS specific model that we're using to preview and and project every single game. There are depth charts and scouting reports for every team in the league that are updated every single week, multiple times a week, just doesn't exist anywhere else at the moment. I mean, injury and suspension reports that are updated regularly as well. Discord community where I, I think we're giving folks constant news updates so they don't have to be on Twitter all the time if they don't want to be. And then also a place where you know we can come in and, and have fun and what we hope are are good and quality in-depth MLS conversations. There's other stuff in the works as well, but that's the that's the rundown. We're super excited about it. Um, I, I think it is a really useful resource. I am biased, but I mean, as somebody who's in and around this league all the time, being able to go in and check a depth chart, being able to go in and look at the data for the last week and look ahead to the next week. I mean, it's it's made my process of looking and writing and watching and talking about this league just so much more streamlined, and I, I've appreciated that. Yeah, I did uh, MLS Today last year and covered the league day in and day out, five shows a week plus everything else, and there is not a lot of coverage around Major League Soccer. If you really care about it, there are large gaps throughout the week where you're not getting anything or you're not learning or you don't get to see things that are going on. And as you said, you have to be following 900 people on Twitter and constantly looking at it. So uh, I've used insights already. It's really helpful. I think it's going to be even more helpful because there are 29 teams now and there are 14 games a weekend and there's more and more and more that's going on. Um, And so I've already found it super useful. And uh, Saturday night in the discord, I thought it was, I I learned a ton just watching games with other smart people who are watching games and talking about what they see. And that was fun for me too, guys, because it, it, I wasn't even really like leading or even a major part of those conversations over the weekend in week one. But like you could tell people were juiced. Like we've got some folks in there. They were having conversations and like pointing out things that I hadn't noticed at all. And that changed to my viewing experience. I don't know. I think I, I'm optimistic. It's not, you know, there's going to be more, right? We're adding more things. There's more ideas that we have that we think are going to be you know, really appealing for folks that are dialed into this league, for folks that are, are in the industry, like like the three of us are and, and have a job to talk about and a job to do. Like we think this provides a lot of real value for a lot of those people. I've just been, I've, I've really enjoyed a lot of the, the early stuff, even just as a user, let alone the creator side. I'm going to be lurking in that discord 
No doubt about it on Saturday nights. Stealing. So if you hear me say (laughs) something on those shows, don't put any false flags in there, is what I'm saying. Please tell me. When there's like eight games going on on the West Coast, God, I need some I need some help to mainline all of it. I can't I need to have some of that. So um yeah, go check it out. Backfield has been great. Really enjoy the the site as well, and obviously the podcast. Uh, even if my kids don't approve, one star from them, Joe. Uh, but I'm, I'm here giving you five stars. So that evens out to two and a half, if that matters for you. I like uh, let's it. talk about the games that we care about, though. I'm going to go with St. Louis, three. Charlotte. One to five would be three. I was I was wondering about the math yeah. there, but decided just yeah. to let that one slide. Yeah, no, no. Good point. Good point. See, that's the sort of thing that, you know. That's why you need insights. That's the, yeah, that's why I need insights. That's the Discord for you. They would not. They would hold me accountable on my uh, oh. my averages there. Uh, okay, so Luis asked us for the games that we're looking at. And it's all about stories for him. And I don't think there's a bigger story in the league uh, in the early days in 2023 than St. Louis City SC. Certainly the story of match day one was the upset that they pulled in Austin. But I think the story of match day two, regardless of the result, is going to be what Major League Soccer looks like in St. Louis. I just, I, having been down the road from St. Louis for most of my you know childhood and a lot of my adult life as well, it's a city that may not have this huge oversized place in the U.S. in terms of like size or what they're known for outside of sporting culture. Like whether it's the Cardinals, whether it was the Rams, of course soccer and previously not really at the professional level, but all the way down through the amateur ranks and at times in history at the professional level as well. I mean, I mean, I grew up hating the steamers like with a passion. Like the wings steamers for me was, you know, outside Comets was like it was the matchup we hated. We didn't like that they were physical. We didn't like they came to Wichita and just kicked us around. We didn't like how successful they were. And now they have their own MLS team, St. Louis City. So I've been to the stadium a couple times. It is truly distinct is what I would say. The way that it um, sits within that sort of downtown core, I think is going to be amazing. What they're building around it is maybe even more incredible than the building itself between the training facilities, the, the team offices, the bars that are popping up. I know a new soccer bar just popped up right around the corner. So you have this sort of, you have a district that's really it's dedicated to soccer and professional soccer, and that's not something that we see everywhere. Yeah, I, I understand, Otters. You know, the Blues, St. Louis folks are getting mad at me. Hockey erasure. Yes, yes, I understand. But I'm just no, not I a hockey think, fan personally. I think you're fine. Yeah, I think but we were all the stadium okay itself. The the way that you walk in and it's basically the field level is below ground. The way that that roof covers and just looks like something that no other MLS stadium has. I can't wait to see all those people, and I'm thinking of you, Matt Baker, file into that stadium on Saturday night against Charlotte and, and have a party. I mean, Dave, we've done this before. We've been to new stadium openings. We've been to expansion first times. Have I ever mentioned a march in Cincinnati? <laughs> it's just a different feeling. There's never going to be that specific feeling ever again for St. Louis, and I hope that everybody who can is able to get to that game and if they're not, they're able to experience the hoopla around the stadium. And if they can't do that, just watching on TV, I know that Taylor Twalman, who's going to be on the call, is going to be transmitting a lot of emotion your way. It's just it's an emotional experience to have that first in your own stadium. And I think it's by far the biggest story of this match day. And it's one of those unique moments, as you said, we've been to a couple of them, even ones that happened during the season, where the hope and the excitement is not tied to the quality of the team or the need for results. Like it is this moment that will happen where no one really cares. The soccer kind of will happen how it happens. And, you know, we were in DC when that stadium opened and obviously the history to get it open. uh, And that wasn't a great DC United team at the time. And no one, no one wants to talk about it. Like everyone was just excited and they were excited to be a part of it. So yeah, I agree. It's going to be a special day. Um, The soccer history in that city is uh, un. Uh, unmatched in the U S and, you know, you go back to the fifties, of course, and the history of building that national team. But when you look at USMNT history and USWNT qualifying in the eighties, in the nineties, it was always in St. Louis and the fans always came out. So yeah, it's going to be special to see them get that opportunity and they've got a team coming off a huge win. So there is that positivity on the field as well. I think it's interesting that they play Austin and then Charlotte, it's like an expansion lesson. I know. It's a, a back-to-back, back, huh? Uh, so I, I guess good on the, the schedule makers for nailing that one. But it's it, it has everything in this game. Right? It has hope on the field. It's got commitment off the field. 
it's got an ownership group that's connected to the city and it's got a city that's been yearning for this for a really long time. So it's definitely the first tune in, I think, this weekend for everyone. Uh, 8.30 p.m., Apple TV, MLS Season Pass. If you're not subscribed and you're listening to this show, I don't know what to tell you at this point. Charlotte Soccer Show hit us up and said, we know how to crash a party, which is good because they had their own party that got crashed on match day one. <laughs> Joe, give me your first impressions of St. Louis and what we might see from this game on the field. Yeah, I think we'll see something similar this week to what we saw last week from St. Louis, which was a team that was committed to pressing in a lot of different ways, especially early that came out really intense in that match. I thought against Austin, they were feeding off the energy from the crowd, I think, in a lot of different ways. But one thing that stood out to me, and I, I talked about this with Jordan on the, the show you referenced earlier that your kids weren't a big fan of, uh, you know, St. Louis actually played a little bit, right? Like they actually tried to build in certain moments. And, and a lot of that for me centered around Edward Loven in midfield, who I thought was really impressive. I think he was one of the best performers on match day one, was in team of the week, deservedly so. I mean, this guy has skill on the ball. He's got some range to him. He's got the physical profile. I really enjoyed watching Loven play. So yeah, I think, I think they're going to want to come out, especially at home, and try to do a few different things with the ball and then force those transition moments and create those opportunities for themselves to really make life difficult for Charlotte and to not really give them much room to breathe. I mean, Charlotte on the flip side, I need to see more, man. Yeah. 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 No, hundred percent. Yeah. It was ahead, a guys. tough, fir- it, it was a tough first game for them. Um, it'll take a little time with Capetti, I think, but there is a part of them that just comes down to like, they've got two wingers that are a, a high part of their salary that are not difference makers like consistently for this team. And they're probably the ceiling's probably not that high. If that's the truth over the course of this year, TBD, but tune in eight 30 PM Eastern just to see St. Louis. And I think there's nobody better than Taylor Twelman. I mean, they won, he's in the studios here in New York city when they won and he is just losing it the other day. Obviously it means something uh, huge to him personally, Joe, what's your game that you're watching, man? Yeah, so I want to see somebody new, baby. I want to see one of these new teams coming into the, into, uh, the 2023 season. So Chicago against and NYCFC. And you picked the fire. And you picked the fire. I did. What I a- picked the fire. Not LAFC, not the Galaxy. I picked the fire. I'm deep down in the weeds. I'm in the trenches. Let's go. I mean, the fire didn't play last week. They're the odd team out. Uh, you know, we were supposed to see El Trafico. That, of course, did not happen. You know, what does this team looks like? What, what, what do they look like this year, right? Are they going to be improved? Because let's face it, like – there's not a lot of real roster improvement that's happened here. So Jan Duran is, is gone. Gaga Salina is gone. They're, I mean, I think we're all assuming over the course of 2023, they're going to replace Salina with youth and Chris Brady. You know, up top, they've made a couple of signings, right? They signed a, a new young teenage striker. They traded for Kai Kamara. I'm, I'm not sure that either of those moves are going to massively elevate this team. It seems like they're, they're going to wait for that real DP that catches their eye to come in and, and sort of do that job or to try to elevate the attack. But what does this team look like? They weren't, I know a lot of us picked them towards or at the bottom of the Eastern conference. They weren't like bad in a lot of different ways last year. Defensively, they were relatively solid between the boxes. They were solid. The issue came in the hardest part of the field, right? It came in, in the final third. It came inside the box. The fire need more out of their stars and need more out of Shakiri this year, who was fine last year, but you don't go out and sign Shakiri for him to be fine. So I want to see what version of Shakiri we get. I think we saw a motivated and effective Hector Herrera for Houston last year. And I know they're not the same player. They play different roles, but relatively similar profile. And they mean relatively similar things to their teams. And what do we see from Shakiri? What do we see from Jairo Torres and Chris Mueller? Can they be more effective and, and really incisive in the final third? I, I think a lot of questions right now around Chicago, but hopefully this weekend we'll get some answers. We'll get to James Sands in New York City. He's back, by the way, returning from Rangers. I want you to give a grade, Dave, for the uh, the Greek signing. And we're, we're not known for our Greek pronunciation. so This one's uh, not hard. Go ahead. It's Kutsias. Kutsias, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Teenage uh, forward and then Kai Kamara. Grade that. I, yeah. Uh, so combined, I think it's probably a BB plus for the year. And Joe, I know you said, like, I, I don't know how much Kai matters. Nine goals, seven assists last year. He would have been the leading scorer on Chicago. And he right. was one low of the bar, top. Low bar. <laughs> low bar. But again, how did but it also, get better? But also in a team that understood exactly what they were about and had yeah, one of the best yeah. cultures in the entire league. But I would add, started a playoff game because people choose to forget Romel Kyoto basically didn't play the last six weeks of the season in the playoffs. And Kai stepped in as a creator and as a goal scorer and carried that role for him. Kai changed his game a lot 
They played to his feet. He created for his teammates a lot more. Seven assists proves that, but I think it was more eye test than just constantly making a back post run. So I think he he added to what he can do in MLS and added is probably the wrong word for a guy of his stature and, and his career, but he showed the elements he can bring. That's going to work. Like he he knows this league. He's going to produce. You're going to get nine or 10 goals out of Kai Kamara this year. Cause I'd also remind you, he didn't, I don't even think he joined the team at the start of the year last year. Like he didn't play a full season. So you're getting the guarantee and then you've got the potential in the other under 22 signing and you still have the DP spot open. Clearly they've struck out on their DP targets. So I guess my grading would be if you do that, bringing in Kai Kamara for relatively nothing is as safe a backup move. And we're going to hold over until the, the window closes or the next window as you can make in major league soccer. Uh, and the expectation should be that he makes them better right now. And, Jairo Torres had a really tough run last year. Like he played a full season, came out of it, and then was supposed to step on the field mid-season in, for Chicago a week later. He gets injured. He's out most of the year. And Chris Mueller joined the team while the season had already started. So if you have belief that those players have the ability, which I think you should, to step up, there should be some promise there for Chicago. I blame MLS today and Michele Giannone for my Jairo Torres hopes I, and dreams. Yeah. That were then dashed. But Kelly but. would like you to know that he said he should play center mid and Shakiri should play wing, and that never happened. Okay. Okay. By the way, Kai Kamara, if he gets nine goals this year, will tie Landon Donovan for second on the goal scoring chart all time. Chris Wondolowski sitting up on 171 is a ways away from Kai, who said on MLS 360 last week that he's chasing Landon, but not Wando. Of course, Wando and Guarantee. Kai. Guarantee. D2 legends. Kai will be second on that list by the end of this year. Nice. That's a good early season guarantee. Yeah. It's well within reach, too. So you're not going out on like a Ben Bear Seattle will miss the playoffs limb. He's a couple of years too early. Is it safer than my Eber will score more goals than Joseph? It is more safe than that, yes. Okay. I believe. Cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, by the way, Glasshouse Soccer hit us up and said, it's all Greek to me. He listed off the now, let's see, uh, five or six uh, Greek players in MLS and says, we need a Saganaki meter for how hot Love these it. guys are playing. Love and that is like it. flaming feta which is just the most deli- – like, put some honey on that, please. Give me a nice oh, a nice yeah. loaf of bread and a view of the Aegean, and we are we are money. We, we should start filming ba- uh, back yeah, – wow, I forgot what show we were on right now. <laughs> we should start recording extra time out of Astoria, and we yeah. could do a Saganaki um, ranking every single week. James Sands returning from Rangers. Joe, how much does that change in YCFC? It changes them a lot. I'm not convinced that that's the number one problem for this team right now. I'm not sure that anybody really is. That's the the forward alignment and where on earth we're going to see Talos Magno playing. But if we're looking at midfield, I mean, this is massive, right? Things didn't really go well for James Sands, especially over the last few months, essentially frozen out of that team. You know, maybe we maybe we can tie this all the way back to Greg Berhalter causing problems with uh, the Celtic players and Rangers players getting dinner together in Scotland. Nobody over there really liked that all that much. There are other factors here, of course, that that's uh, that's tongue in cheek. But I mean, Sands is a good player. Right? We've seen him be very, very good for this team. We've seen him help them win trophies. You know, there's a lot about this that I like. They need depth. It shouldn't have to be Justin Hack, who I, I thought was was good to find in week one against Nashville. It shouldn't have to be Justin Hack, who's the the second guy at both the six and the eight spot for NYCFC. It should be Keaton Parks. It should be Alfredo Morales when he's ready to go all the way. And it should be a guy like James Sands. Like, that's the level of NYCFC. That's what we've come to expect from them is for them to have depth all over the field. They have a lot of depth in pretty much every spot now, but really, you know, the number nine. And that's still the big question that I have about this team. I hope we see Tiago Andrade start up there and, and Talos Magno on the left because I thought that looked better, not much better, but better in the second half against Austin. I mean, Chicago are going to pose a relatively similar challenge to Austin. They're going to be back I mean, to, uh, to Nashville. Excuse me. They're probably going to be back in that 442 block. NYCFC are going to have to dictate the game even away from home. Who plays the nine, who gets the goals is the big question. But Sands, we'd be to go all the way back to your original question. He certainly makes this team better. By the way, Santi Rodriguez on the radio in Uruguay. We specialize in Instagram reporting, Twitch reporting, which we'll get to in a second, as well as uh, South American radio. Uh, Santi Rodriguez, even though there are no official, there's no emails, no press releases, no nothing, he's still in Uruguay by my understanding, went on the radio and said, yeah, the deal is done. I'm with NYCFC. So if you're looking at a midfield, long term, could Sands sign a contract, I believe, till 2027 of Keaton Parks, Sands, and Santi? It's a pretty good young midfield to build around for the future. 
for yeah. NYCFC. All right, Dave, what are you watching? I'm going to go with the other teams that uh, Joe left off that he didn't see last weekend because, of course, he's so excited about the Chicago Fire, and I could feel that energy coming fire, through. Joe, so fire, I appreciate it. Fire, but I'm going to go with the fire, LA teams. Uh, you've got the Galaxy and LAFC, obviously, who didn't get to kick off because of the weather out in California. So the Galaxy heading to Dallas, LAFC hosting the Portland Timbers in this one. And uh, Dallas was one of the disappointing teams in week one. They underperformed against Minnesota. They didn't create chances. I thought it was a little bit odd that Giovanni Jesus didn't get the start. I thought he was good off the bench. There's a bunch of question marks there. And then the Galaxy, this is one of the unknowns in MLS. And I know Joe's pretty high on them. I'm lower than he is. And uh, I don't know where the confidence comes from outside of Ricky Poot. Yeah. Do you need more? Do you need more evidence than that? I mean, yeah, I think this team is is continuing to get stronger. They've got number nine depth. The reason why I believe in them, though, most of all, is because they've got the best darn player in the league, right? Puj is the most talented player in here by a mile. They've addressed right back now at this point. They've they've started to address the lack of depth in central midfield. But, I mean, you look at that position group, and we were talking about this a little bit in the pre-show. They still have more depth and quality there in players that can deputize at the number eight or the number ten than like half the teams in this league. So they go out and sign a couple of wingers this offseason. I I like a lot of the pieces. And when you have a guy who's going to open that trophy window wide open for you, like Ricky Puj can, like this is a team that can make some noise. It'll be interesting to see the that those center backs against the Jesus Ferreira if he drops in and starts to try and find the ball as Ariola makes runs, right? Does Raheem Edwards track him well? I think there's a lot of question marks there for the Galaxy. I'm low-key excited about Tyler Boyd. This feels like a signing that could work because... You talked, wow, you've talked yourself into it. No, huh? I haven't. I've been in it the whole time. <laughs> I just was waiting for the contract because I got burned last year when I was like, Douglas Coast is a fine risk to take as long as he's not a DP. And then he wasn't a DP for five weeks, and then they finally signed him, and he was. So I was waiting to see the Tyler Boyd, you know, Max Tam contract that I'd be less into, but it didn't happen, and it sounds like they're going to get the chance to take a flyer on a guy who brings a lot of what they need, right? Just speed, athleticism, always risking, always taking guys on. He, he's a, you know, I, I talk about this team all the time. He's now an American Ariel and Tuna. Like, and Tuna worked for them, and it was because there was no expectations there. Oh, my God. This has been he, an American Uriel Antuna. Yeah. If you didn't see him in Turkey because you weren't watching those games, now you can well, see you him. Couldn't. He wasn't playing. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, at some point he was, though. There was a point in time before he got to Besiktas, right, that he was playing. That's how he got there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Also, Chicharito, speaking of Twitch, uh, Javier announced on Twitch, I think this all sounds like a dream, that he's out for two to five weeks. With this injury, so it's the day on Jovlic show here for a little while. And also, Ricky is now a DP. So if you're wondering, oh, they have an open DP spot. What are the Galaxy going to do with it? Oh. They've just, they've given it to Ricky. So Ricky is now rightfully, as Joe said, one of the best players in the league, a uh, designated player. And Lucas Caligari is their U22 right back from Brazil. The flip side is LAFC. Get their opener at home. What's the one thing on LAFC you're looking forward to seeing most? The That's center you. forward position. Is it a Poku? And what does it look like? with him getting the start up there and maybe playing a full 90 um, at that position. If he's good, this is one of the better starting 11s in Major League Soccer still carrying over from last year. If he's not, it puts a lot of responsibility on Buanga, a lot on Carlos Vela at this age, and Cifuentes has to become a goal scorer. All right. Let's keep it rolling here. Daniel, uh, excuse me. Uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, JDB hit us up. How about player profiles? Pick a guy and break him down draft prospect style. We're not going to go draft prospect style, but we are going to pick a guy. And I'm going to give you um, a tweet from Daniel Morris, Joe. And Daniel asked who our David Goss theorem player of the year is. Obviously, we've done that on a prediction show, but we haven't heard who yours would be. So who's your David Goss theorem player of the year in 2023? And you're also watching him, of course, in match day two. Yep. So I, I don't know that I love this pick from me, but I think it's an interesting one. So I'll, I'll lead in with that. Christian Menteke is my choice. He is my choice here for DC United. I think we saw a much better and much more rejuvenated version of Christian Benteke in week one than we saw at any point last year. I also think we saw a more cohesive and probably pragmatic version of DC United this week, last week, 
than we saw at any point under Wayne Rooney in, in 2022. Last year, like they were doing some wild positional play stuff that I couldn't tell if it was planned or if they were just <laughs> ad-libbing on the fly because Andy Nahar likes to have fun. Like I don't know what was going on with that team last year. This year, they are still doing some fun things with the ball, mostly still Andy Nahar stuff with the ball. But I think when they get into the attack, their game plan is not refined. Their game plan is a lot of, we've got a big boy in the box, let's find that guy. And Christian Bateke can make that work. Like He dunks on Toronto for his goal on Saturday. It's a really nice big man, classic number nine striker goal. And he looked dialed in defensively. To me, it feels like if you can get 2,000 minutes out of Benteke this year, you're probably looking at you know, 15, 16 goals. And you're looking at maybe a couple of other contributions as well in other phases of the game. That to me feels like it checks the boxes for a David Goss theorem guy. That'd be a, that it'd be huge for producing on. Anders' golden boot team right there. Because I'm pretty sure he has been Teke. Right, Anders? Let me know in the in the comments. Did no one we'll, take Benteke? No, no I, I think, don't think anybody I think Tom did. took him. No? Oh, did Tom take him? Uh, Tom yeah. seems terrible. Anders just, says just someone like has him. Uh, <laughs> okay, no, give me I, would add, I would add to what Joe said about Benteke. That goal, um, he he waits, right? Yeah. The whole That whole time, Kuti Pietro is dribbling. Him and Christian Fletcher interchange along the left side. Benteke is hanging back, so he has the ability to step forward and win it. And then, as as Joe said he can dominate when he steps forward and wins it, right? There's bodies flying off him and he doesn't notice them. That's Christian Benteke at his best. And then as he gets confident, now you can start to play off him. Uh, yeah. And I think it's really, it is really exciting to see what he can be this year because uh, I chatted with him in preseason and he's like one of the best people. He's just so calm and like he's down chill, to dude. earth. And he's, he's so like chill. excited to go see the cherry blossoms and go to an NBA game. And you're like, Oh, and he's like, yeah, I'll try and get tickets. Try and get tickets, bro. You're Christian Benteke. They're going to give you tickets. You can go see whatever you want to do. So he sounds like a, a good dude. And I think it, it would be exciting for DC. So he, he has a lot of potential and DC has one of those teams that could average five and a half, six goals in their games for and against in every game. So that'd be fun. Uh, it's uh, I'm sad to announce and to report that Matt Doyle has Christian Benteke. So if indeed 15 or 16 goals is coming, uh, that yeah. is uh, that's a bummer. Uh, Mula Atari hit us up and said, hey, spend more time discussing how massively underrated DC is. Hashtag play your kids. Ooh. Joe, which of the kids did you uh, did you enjoy most in match day one? It's got to be Teddy KDP, right? It has to be. It absolutely has to be. Most elite Nick. Stop it, Kudu Pietro. What a goal. <laughs> I didn't realize when you guys played that on uh, on Monday, Andres pulling the strings. I didn't realize that that was Bobby until yeah. God, you said it was Bobby. It doesn't even. I mean, that really just threw me for a loop. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it until you connected the dots for me. But I mean, he's. I don't know that he is an elite. I, let me let me rephrase. He, I don't think he is an elite MLS talent at this point. I don't think that's going to be the future for for Teddy KDP. But I think he brings a lot of nice complementary skills that can help this team. Likes to arrive in the box, has a lot of energy. You know, he can bridge some gaps that I think are in this DC United team right now. I don't think he's going to drop like 10 and 10 or 10 and 5 or 5 and 5, probably even at some point this year. But, you know, he can be a guy that sets up the actual stars of this team to do their thing. I bet we'll see more of Kudé Pietro as this year goes on. I'm going to say Matai Akimboni, 16 year old center backs, don't come along often and get playing time. But Wayne Rooney, man, he's putting his money where his mouth is. You're either 35 or you're 16 or 18 on this DC team. Uh, we'll see what they do uh, this weekend. So uh, how about this, Dave? Who's your guy? Who are you watching? Who's my draft breakdown Mel Kuyper style? Exactly, yeah. I'm just assuming that's the music that ESPN puts on. What I'm looking for in the second round is one of the best offensive tackles in the game. He can get outside. Uh, I'm going to pick Connor Ronan on this one. <laughs> Connor Ronan would go directly into the David Goss, likes to connect quick pass, would never score a goal, a best 11, which would be mm -hmm. 11 versions of that. So Gotti Kinda's in that team. Brandon Cervania might be in that team. Latif Blessing's definitely in that team. Uh, and Connor Ronan might have a spot as well. What was fun about watching him play was the way he sets the chessboard. And so when you watch Colorado build out and – I, I understand a lot of this is in theory right now because of how bad it went in Seattle. There was moments where he went to the right back spot to open up angles for Ralph Preso and help them build out when he realized Seattle had too many numbers inside. There was moments where he went high and was able to drop someone else underneath him. There was moments where he dropped in a center back and was able to pick up the ball and create space. I think he has a really good understanding of how to move pieces around. I think he's comfortable under pressure on the ball and he 
seems to be at least elusive on the half turn where it's not always the predicted move that's coming next. What's exciting for Colorado is how that fits next to Jack Price because Jack Price, I think, more confidence on the ball, better to hit that long ball. Ralph Preso kind of would pick it up and dribble into the space and then sort of turn back and recycle possession. I think Jack Price can use what Connor Ronan does to be more effective. And I think Ronan, you see why they're so excited about this, right? They, he takes what they've had in the past few years from four or five different players, wraps it all into one and gives them all those attributes. Some of what Cole Bassett brought, some of what Jack Price brings, some of what uh, Max was supposed to bring to this team, some of what Mark Anthony Kay and Kellen Acosta brought. And I think it, you can roll it out there and he can be pretty special. Yeah, you figure he's like a connector between Price and Bassett. Gets the best out of most of them or, or both of them. Now, like nobody got... Uh, the best out of the Rapids other than the Sounders last weekend. But I know Honors is reveling in this discussion in the chat. But like, oh, what? Well, the way his team got run off the field, was that fun? Was that good? Uh, just so you know how Honors experiences these shows. Uh, Colorado hosting Kansas City at 9.30 p.m. on Saturday night. All the games are on Saturday this week. And to go back to Christian Benteke, uh, D.C. will be in Columbus at 7.30. I'm going with Kip Keller, Austin at home again against Montreal. It was a nightmare, man. It was tough for him. I think Josh Wolf is going to stick with uh, with Kip Keller. I think he should stick with Kip Keller. And there's bad news for Austin. Julio Cascante, who was the reason Kip Keller had to come into the game in the first place, is out for at least eight weeks. That is not a negligible amount of time. That is, if you're translating at home, two months. It's better. My averages are better on months than they are on... <laughs> Uh, regular it's not an month. average weeby that's converting weeks into months. God, yeah but i did it i, I knocked it down there Got it. Uh, uh this is tough <laughs> and we're gonna go into who they might look around in the league at here in a second but i want your take uh joe on this one lafc zone said kip keller's boneheaded pass the other team for a goal talk about that one mls twitter is outraged that jared stroud allegedly called for the ball some are going as far as saying that's quote the dirtiest thing you can do in a soccer game what are your thoughts p.s everyone crying about it is soft <laughs> i uh I mean, it's good content, isn't it? Like that's oh, that's great. where I come down with a lot of this stuff. Like, I don't have a strong opinion about whether it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. You're going out there if you're Jared Stroud and trying to make plays to win your team games. If Jared Stroud and Kip Keller had no relationship, I don't think we've we would have been talking about this for as long as we have. The fact that they're friends does make it cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's the part that makes this absolutely frigid. I don't think I would have the guts to to go out there and pull a Jared Stroud and method act like to get that ball. Reason for that outside of just the fact that I'm like not super athletic. So I don't know. It's it's not the worst thing you can do on a field. A crunching tackle that's like trying to hurt somebody or kicking the ball at somebody in the stands is way worse. But I I don't think I would have pulled a Jared Stroud in that moment. But I'll be honest, I don't have a major problem with the fact that he did. I have never scored a professional goal, so I might just for the opportunity pull a Jared Stroud, but I would assume that it wouldn't work, and somehow in this case it did. All right, if you're Austin, you've got some options. You stick with Kip Keller. Maybe you push Amro Tarek in early. Maybe Alex Ring could drop back. I think he played 10 or so games for NYCFC at center back, but then it's a Ring, Vicenin. Uh, I guess it's all Finns on that on the on at center back if you do that so from a nationality perspective that would be interesting but maybe not physically going to be able to match up with every single team uh you could go around the league and try to make a signing you get a free agent from outside the league you could maybe look at mls next pro or usl but here's some names we threw out there as possible guys that they should call about xavier ariaga i threw daniel steras in there though i don't know that houston is going to take away that depth as most mls teams can't afford it Colorado is one of the few teams that has depth at center back. I mean, maybe Abubakar Keda. Maybe. I don't know the allocation <laughs> money situation for Austin. Maybe. DC, Donovan Pines, Brendan Heinz Ike. Heinz Ike is coming back from a season ending, in, uh, ending injury, and uh, maybe Pines needs a different locale. Uh, loans for homegrowns inside the league, though that doesn't really seem to solve a problem for a cup contender and uh, Brandon Craig and maybe Thomas Williams, Tommy Williams in Orlando. Are you taking those guys on loan? Yeah, you can do two loans now in MLS. That's a new – previously like, it was one. Philly is not – and and Orlando are not trading you those guys. No, correct. Right? No, those no, are their future. Strictly to get those guys some minutes yeah. as homegrowns. Which I guess could be interesting. We, we don't normally see that. I wouldn't say – listen, Donovan Pine sitting behind a center mid and a 16-year-old. I'm not sure. Right now, people in MLS consider that an upgrade. 
uh, at that position, but they do have Nolan Sheldon, uh, part of the front office in Austin, and he worked with Pines in the DC Academy. So maybe I think Ariaga is the obvious one. He is a starter in MLS, hands down. He might be an elite defender in the right uh, in the right system. Austin seems like it would be the right system. He's a great passer out of the back. I don't know if Vicenin would play on the right, but I, I, that's splitting hairs at this point. Um, but you have to give something up to get him. We know Inter Miami reached out for him. They ended up signing some big name players instead, which shows you, I think, the level that Ariaga is considered at. And you're starting to get down to it where if Seattle doesn't feel like they have to move him, they're going to be able to push that price up because you're all against your, you know, every other team in this league that needs a center back, their back is against the wall trying to get it done. It also helps a rival. Like this isn't, oh, Austin and Seattle, there's no connection. That's direct rivals at the top of the Western Conference. So you have to offer something that really interests. Um, Seattle, but Ariaga would make a ton of sense in that system. Now, I would say they lost Ruben Gabrelson. They brought in Leo Weissman. So in their eyes, Weissman is an A1 in Major League Soccer because Conte is your other starter. You have two guys in, for depth. Like, I don't think the world has changed if Weissman is ready to play at the level they expect him to. And so I don't know that they would rush to make this move after week one. Uh, I would just say, and I went and looked at the transfer market. Brisson is a free agent, uh, and if that if you have immediate name recognition with Brisson, you are our people. Nice. Uh, former FC Dallas uh, Brazilian center back, he was back in Brazil, but his team of I got relegated out of uh, Serie A. So, I mean, that's that's one that you could maybe like kick the tires on. I don't know what Austin's cap situation is. I don't know what their allocation money situation is. Uh, my instinct, Joe, is that you've just got to you've got to let Keller play through it. Like it can't. It's never going to be. Knock on wood for for Kip Keller. Like I don't wish for bad things for him. It's never going to be as bad as it was in match day one. Yeah, you you've hit bottom from a coaching perspective. I think it probably is the right thing to do to give him more reps, or at least to have him involved in some capacity. Like maybe you don't have to start him week two, but you know I think you probably have to find a spot for him on the field somewhere at some point in that game. Otherwise, just the messaging to a, a relatively young player is really difficult. If I'm Austin, I'm both trying to cultivate and rebuild Kip Keller's confidence. I'm also calling people, right? Like, you have to. Center back for me, you know, going back and forth with Austin fans on Twitter, which I think everyone on earth has had an experience with at this point. You know, one of the weaknesses that I was pointing out about this squad heading into 2023 is center back. Like, even if even if Cascante is healthy, like, I... I I don't think we're looking at him as much more than a slightly above league average center back. And, and you know, new signings are, are hit and miss. That's the whole point of the Goss theorem. Like, you know, there is not proven talent. There is not proven exceptional talent in Major League Soccer in their center back core. It just doesn't exist. So if I'm Austin, I'm, I'm trying to get Kip Keller back up to uh, up to speed and get him even, you know, to improve. But I'm calling Seattle. Like, if, if I'm sporting Kansas City, I'm calling Seattle. If I'm FC Dallas, I mean, did you guys see Dallas struggled so much on the right side of their uh, of their attack because Sebastian Ibiaga it's not a good passer. Like, I mean, there's so many teams in this league that need something. And Dallas have kind of already made their gambles, and I guess they, they think they've already replaced Matt Hedges. I'm just not convinced that's actually the case. But, like, if you're a sporting Kansas City in Austin at the very least, you've got to be picking up the phone and calling whoever you can, whether that's Seattle or Colorado. Maybe Philly is willing to send you Brendan Craig for a season. I'm skeptical about that, Weeby, just because of the number of competitions they're going to be in. Like, it's tough if you're these teams. It's really tough right now. So I would I agree with you. And I would add, I think we should take a lesson from Columbus letting Mensa go and not attempting to replace him by say I, I don't think teams see value in the market at center back. And it really is trust your kids, trust adjustments. Like, because if you do go out and get stuck, you brought up Daniel Steris. That's one of the higher spent on players that I don't know you're getting a ton of value for. And like, I don't know that Austin would want to enter into that contract and have Daniel Sarah's at 800,000 or whatever it is on their books for however long. It's 450. Just so. okay. Whatever so, it is. Yeah, yeah. But like, what's his next contract look like? So I don't know that teams really want to get into that category. And I think that's why an Amro Tar gets resigned. In Major League Soccer, coming from outside the league, you reset the number, you can bring them in, you don't have to give up anything inside the league to add those players. And so it doesn't feel like a spot. Now, Casey's different. 
because Casey's been in the market the whole offseason. They lost another player in Courtney Ford. It sounds like with this Colombian center back, yeah, they've done their homework. They are further along in the process rather than panicking and trying to bring someone in late on. Daniel Rosero, by the way, is the name of uh, that center back, 29-year-old, right-footed junior FC is where he would come from. Uh, so we'll see what happens when, uh, when, when and if that one gets announced. Tommy Scoops is all over it. Locomotive Crayon Flag FC, which is just an incredible four words <laughs> smashed together. Uh, thought experiment, guys. Give me your wildest takes on a theoretical one-for-one -one trade where two MLS teams swap one player each and both teams come out better. Could be for the same position or role or not. Bonus points for involving the highest profile players. Um, we haven't got the most high profile players, but one of the first ones we came up with was an Xavier Ariaga uh, trade, Daniel Shallowy for Ariaga. Dave, explain why this might make sense. It's one of the few these teams have depth or are willing to give things up. Um, and so you have a player in Daniel Shallowy who takes the space that Seattle is looking to fill, which is their left wing. And Jordan Morris, obviously the go-to starter, but a ton of competitions, League's Cup. This is a club that historically used to like to challenge an Open Cup. They gave up on that since Clint Dempsey tore up that notebook, but maybe they'd try and do it again. Um, so you bring in Daniel Shalloway, who's a goal scorer, flexible, fills a role they need, is also young, is a very Seattle signing, right? Which is, this is a guy who can be part of your Christian Roldan, Jordan Morris core for the next five to eight years in MLS. He re-signed his deal. And then on the flip side, you're giving up the thing that Casey needs the most which is center back and a center back who will pass. This is a team now that likes to have possession. Um, a Casey, I think could cover for shallow with Sonus who they already brought in. Gotti Kinda when healthy is flexible. Polito plus Agata plus Kyrie Shelton can all play different positions. And then Johnny Russell as well. Eric Tommy has been a winger in his career as well. So they can move pieces. I think to cover that, it feels like one of those both teams get what they want deal. It's incredible for Daniel Shalloway that at 26 years old, he's still getting passed off for young, Dave. Well, he's younger than a 30-year-old who's at the end of his career, right? How many years does Daniel Shalloway have left in his peak? Six? Seven? Boy, you're really handing out peak years like it's candy. Just seven peak years. How many peak years could he possibly have? Uh, this is Leo Chu Eraser. Uh, so, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see. I like it, though. I like it. I, I think it elevates the Sounders and um, probably like for like on the salary front. We had this one, Joe. Frankie Amaya for Caleb Wiley. Walk people through yeah. that. I like this one a lot. I think this is probably my favorite of the ones that we were chatting about in the pre-show. So Frankie Amaya, the Red Bulls have 8,000 central midfielders who can all do roughly the same thing. I think that's how <laughs> I think that's how Garrett Struber likes it. But, I mean, they don't need 8,000. They can do a 7,999. So if, if Amaya goes to Atlanta... For Caleb Wiley, who's not starting, he's not, you know, first choice at left wing, he's not first choice at left back, figuring that John Tolkien for the Red Bulls could be going abroad across the Atlantic before too long at some point over the next, I don't know, nine months or so, I think we would expect Tolkien to go ahead and move on. The interest is, is reportedly there. You know, you get the Red Bulls, somebody who can contribute this year in Wiley and basically be in the same role that he's in in Atlanta on that left side, playing left back, left wing back, maybe a little higher at times. You get him into the system in New York. You get him some reps. Then Tolkien leaves. It works out for, for the Red Bulls. And then Atlanta just need, they need quality and they need depth and they need central midfielders who are capable of impacting games in this league. And in, in Rosetto and in Santiago Sosa and Franco Ibarra and Sedic, I mean, I, I'm not sure there are many folks out there that, that are convinced that any of those players are real difference makers in MLS. I'm not totally sure that Frankie Amaya is at this point either, but I think he is probably more of an asset in this league and can give you a little bit more than any of those players I just mentioned. You have a three-way trade, Dave. I tried. I'm not as happy about this anymore as I was when we started it because I kind of like the shallowy Ariaga trade better. I was trying to move Ariaga. I was trying to get him to Austin. I don't think a like-for-like -like trade makes sense between those two teams. So then I tried to rope in Vancouver because I do think Vancouver has – uh, depth in quote unquote wingers without playing with wingers. And then obviously they have holes in their team because they are not an elite team in major league soccer, but it's hard to kind of fill them. So the deal here was Ariaga moves to Austin. Uh, Christian Dahomey moves from Vancouver to Seattle. And then one of the left backs in Lundquist, Kolmanich or Gallagher uh, moves from Austin to 
Vancouver. I'm not in love with it anymore. I'm not yeah, as convinced. Really underselling this one. It, it could I work. Know. I just had one that came to mind just because I'm thinking about the Chicago Fire and, and, and number nines. And probably they're going to get their DP nine, so they don't need something long term. What if just for the content, again, the banter, the Rebs are just swimming in nines? You've got Gustavo Bo is back. You've got Veroni, who Bruce Arena says is young and he's 24. So you guys are on the same wavelength, uh, Dave, as far as you know, youth and age goes. And then you have don't Josie trade. Altidore. Don't just, trade. <laughs> just hanging out. You got Josie out there just hanging out. Where? Going to the fire. Oh, uh, interesting. I thought you were going to say Nashville. Uh, now I'm on into, Na- okay, now I'm into Nashville. I, I, yeah. I had the wrong team. I was going to, because I'm a big Brian Gutierrez guy and I want him to play more. I was going to say Gutierrez back the other way. And then Gutierrez could play on the right wing or just sort of like basically intern under Carlos Heel. Uh, and seemingly would would pick up a lot from heel. Not that he's not from Shakiri, but if we're what doing world, Nashville, what's going the other way for Josie then? What a world that we live in that to get a young homegrown attacking player minutes, you're going to send him to Bruce Arena's team rather than play for the Chicago Fire. What a world we live in, uh, how it's all changed. I guess with Nashville um, for New England, I guess you'd give one of the center midfielders away, right? Brian they, and they I'm going to... Dax, one of There's those no depth guys there for them. Well, it's like how many for two teams? spots, and you have Godoy and Dax, and God bless them. They're, you know, they're not David Goss Young. No, but they have Brian and Ungana and Sean Davis, who I think are kind of the soak up the minutes players as well on that team. I don't know. You could, yeah. I don't really have a great move besides that. It would probably be money in international spots because Nashville doesn't use any of them. But that's not what locomotive. Maybe you said Teal Bunbury wanted. back the other yeah. way. <laughs> and just a nice little a nice little security blanket for Bruce in that sense. All right. A couple four for you and then we'll let you go, Joe. Uh actually let's just do one more because we've taken enough of your time on loan here. We're not actually paying for the privilege, I guess. Justin Shepard, what do you make of Lasada's tactics in his first game in charge in Montreal? I thought it was mixed. I think you can see some of the ideas that are being adopted. It didn't look to me like full-on DC Losada ball high press, which which was a big part of that team in 2021. It's also fair that, you know, when you go back and watch the tape, that team did try to play with the ball a little bit as well. And I think you're seeing them try to keep some of what Neil Fren- Wilfred Nancy was doing with this club. They still want to build. They still want to play at times. The challenges with this team, even with some of the, the Losada wrinkles thrown in, you got Aaron Herrera as the right-sided center back in the back three, which I love. You've got Steven Marrera and Columbus doing virtually the exact same thing. I love that we've got Nance and, and Lasada sort of on the same page with those. But, I mean, the pieces are just such a, a mess for Montreal right now. They have core players that are still in this team, but you lose the one true experienced, I mean, even not that experienced in MLS, but somewhat experienced number 10 that you have before the season, the season even starts in Milievic, and you're struggling. Like, it seems to me, my impression of watching this team is they had a general idea of who they wanted to be, but Lasada is very much still getting to know his players and hoping that a lot of the kids, which has been a hallmark of Montreal over the last few years, turn into something. Will Fernandez got them to turn into something. Will Lasada do that or not? It's way too early for any of us to know, but it's a team that's still trying to find out who they are, even though I think you could see in the shape, you can see in some of the tactical ideas, that they have a, a macro idea of who they want to be maybe by June. Couple months away. Yeah. Couple months away. We Tune will see. Tune in to Montreal this weekend to see <laughs> yeah. them. In play. Austin to see if they can figure out who they are. Uh, big thanks to Joe Lowry, who certainly knows who he is when it comes to analyzing this game and uh, what he wants a soccer podcast to look like. This has been five <laughs> To six, maybe even backfield shows that we've put together. Joe's on the exhausted. Floor. Yeah. So, Joe's doing a full regen <laughs> session after this. Joe, That's thank right. you I'm so much for joining us, man. It's been yeah, a pleasure thank- to chat with you. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. This was fun. Big thanks to Joe Lowry for stretching himself just for more minutes than he could possibly imagine a soccer podcast ever going. Let's keep this mailbag going, Dave. I think it's a good uh, first run through for us here. Mike hit us up, side 433, trying to figure out what his tactical identity is there. said, which team in each conference is best positioned for being competitive long-term based on their core players they can build around? Also, you need to factor in front office support and coaching. I, I think just the like hit somebody over the head, the obvious one is Philadelphia. And we've just seen them already weather best 11 players leaving and just sort of reload both from within the academy, but also scouting. seems like Ernst Tanner is pretty committed, uh, but you never know. And obviously Jim Curtin is a Philly dude 
uh, unless he's going to go, I don't know, with Jesse Marsh to the U.S. national team or maybe do that on the side or find a way in Europe. You're talking about Andre Blake, Elliot Glesnes, uh, Jose Martinez, Leon Flock, Daniel Gazdog has a new deal, probably not yeah. going to be going anywhere. This is like his spot. Carranza, Ura, maybe Carranza could be moved on, but Ura probably not. Uh, it seems like they're a team that you would just point out immediately and say, wow, great core, great future, great present as well. Who do you got? Uh, I think Philly's a good shout in the East, I would say. The other one, I think Red Bulls have to be in that convo. They've shown it in the past, but you lock Sean Nealis in, Carlos Cornell, one of the better goalkeepers in MLS. They have pieces in central midfield that you think will be there for a while. Lewis Morgan just signed a new deal. So again, are these all MLS Cup winners because of who they are? Maybe not. But as you move pieces in and out, you have that spine that you can make it easier for players to come into. Uh, the rest of mine are kind of in the West, and some of them are a little risky uh, in that I don't even know if they're going to win this year around them. But I like Vancouver, and I like San Jose. I think they've put together good teams on good contracts where you can add as you start to get into things for San Jose. I think you look at Jackson Ewell, Grueso, Jeremy Abobasi, the depth at young goalkeepers, and that's probably four or five starters throughout the next five or so years that you can have locked into your team and start to add the pieces around. And obviously they'd kill to put a young center back in there and have someone that they can consistently look at. And then Vancouver, most of the moves they've made are outside of Luis Martins are for players that are on the right side of 27 or 26. And I think they've secured them to pretty good contracts. So you have, again, a spine of a team that Laborda should be around for a while. Tristan Blackman should be around for a while. Andres Kubas, I think, is a key piece. Ryan Gold. Uh, and then you can start to mix and match around them. So those were some of the ones that jumped out to me. Are you surprised Laborda didn't start in week in uh, match day one? A little bit, yeah. Um, it seemed like Vancouver played one team throughout preseason, and then Fanny Sartini sort of reverted back right for the first game. And we've talked a lot about what he said went wrong in preseason last year and why they got off to such a, such a slow start. And it sort of felt like a panic move right out the gates. Uh, I'm going to have a couple other teams here to throw out Cincinnati. So your core of Celentano and goal, Matt Miazga, who's not going anywhere at center back. I don't know. I mean, he's their dude and defensive mm -hmm. mid. We know how important that is. I don't. I think they're going to re-sign Lucho. I just can't see a world in which he's not staying there. And then, yeah, Brenner might be moving, but yeah, Vasquez, again, could move, but maybe they hold on to him with another contract. Yeah, so I get the Cincinnati take there. They got Angulo. They just signed a young cat on U22, so you develop mm -hmm. him up, and then it's him and Nobodo in the midfield. Just but it, it, I don't think Brenner and Brandon Vasquez will be there in a year. It, it definitely you, not in a year you have and a half. Lucho, if you have Lucho and you have their fees, yes. does it matter? But I don't know that you have Lucho. I heard that Lucho was leaving this offseason and Lucho tried to leave D.C. and then it didn't work out. And then he did leave. And so I, I don't know that Lucho is a part of that. If that was the case, I would agree with you. And you add in an Ian Murphy, um, players that can be there for a little while as well. Mar maybe Mar if, if Mar Barry all sticks around. I don't know. He's 22 yeah. and he's maybe ex going to explode. So maybe he doesn't. And you got, you got Foster to back him up. But one him. of those three attacking players has to be a part of that for you yeah, to convince I agree. me. I agree. Dallas is also one that we sort of talked about and threw out there. Um, whether it be the young attackers or the veteran in Areola, Pomichol, Legette in midfield, the questions at center back. I mean, they're outside backs, Farfan and Jesus look, look really good. And then Pais, but... Uh, it TV. feels like it feels like Farfan, Legit, Ariola, and probably Paxton are going to be there for a while. So it, that feels like one of those teams that you could convince me you would need a center back in there. But again, we're talking about teams that have four or five starters consistently that you can change. Uh, Dan McDonald hit us up, said, be great, especially for new listeners to discuss all the trophies and competition and what it takes to win them. Also include Leagues Cup, as if I wasn't going to include Leagues Cup, Dan. <laughs> uh, it's a great review, he says, for new Apple TV MLS Season Pass viewers. So in order of prestige, and then you can tell the fine folks what it takes to win them, Dave. Uh, obviously, number one for me, I am not Doyle. I'm not a truther. MLS Cup is number one by far. <laughs> Oh, and now we're going to do it, or you're going to no, do the you, whole list? You, okay. you tell us what it takes to win it. Uh, so MLS Cup, there isn't a perfect formula. Different teams have done it in different ways, but normally you have, going into games, you have the best attacker, and or at least on form, and an elite back line. And so you don't beat yourself 
and then you have special players that are able to create moments of brilliance. We've seen other models work, but when you go back over the last few years, Columbus with Zellerion, sort of, you know, Jonathan Mensa solidifying the back and then Zellerion being special. Uh, obviously, LAFC had that special talent as well in their on their side, and Philly has shown it, making it there, but not winning it over the last few years. And then you go back to the TFC Seattle days where Chad Marshall and um, and Drew Moore were some of the big parts of their team. And then you had the Clint Dempsey's and even more importantly, the Josie Altidores and the Sebastian Javinkos. So number two, and this might be a surprise for some of you. I'm just going to say it. You know, it's league excellence for a full season. Supporter yeah. Shield. Should you were going to put a new pause. competition in number two. <laughs> yeah. Should have had a longer pause there. I, it's got to be the supporter shield for me. I mean, I, I go back to what Doyle said. I do agree with him. Having just excellent results and soccer and consistency over the course of a full season, that's the most important thing. It puts you in position, the best possible position to win MLS Cup because you have home field advantage. And I just think that the shield itself, the story behind it, the way the supporters have you know, birthed it and and sort of like – nurtured it into what it is even when others maybe didn't care as much including the players and the coaches i think there's tremendous legacy and heritage in the supporter shield and it means you get to watch good soccer all year long and i would add to the what takes what it takes to win it is normally an ethos to your club because you have to replace players throughout the season and what philly has shown us and red bulls have shown us in lafc um, over the last few years is if you have a commitment to a style and so therefore you can bring players in who can be like for like changes over the course of a year that's what it, that's what it takes to win this competition it can't just be on pure talent because pure talent means you'll have players that are injured that are out that need rest that go to international breaks you need to have a committed style and that's i think the other part that's fun about having team win sport shield is you get to watch them win every week they get to be good, but you also get to watch them grow and sort of you get to know what you're getting into every single week. And number three on the list of order of prestige is a tie. Open Cup and Canadian Championship. I, again, we're going to get the League's Cup. Don't you worry about that. I, I love it. It's you know It occupies a, a significant chunk of my soccer heart. But ultimately, we talk about an Open Cup and the history there and what it's meant over so many years and the fact that it does bring every sort of nook and cranny of the um, of the American soccer sphere into its gate. I, I have to put it there. And then I've just seen over the years the Canadian Championship, the vitriol, the quality of games, the level of chaos, how much it matters, the fact that it qualifies you for CCL. I, I'm going to put those tied number three for me right now. And also because everybody participates. Like to me, that's an important part of the prestige of them is that everybody has a chance and uh, I like that. I like that about both tournaments. And for the Canadian Championship, a, a one that's growing a lot. CPL now becoming involved. Now you've got a new league uh, in British Columbia. You're adding a new league in Quebec. Uh, and obviously the League One Ontario teams that are pushing in. So more games than ever, as well as some regional rivalry that we never really got to see before. One of the keys with Canadian Championship specifically is depth in domestic players. There are limits to the amount of international players you can play. Same with the U.S. Open Cup. It's a bit less uh, strict in the U.S. Open Cup. So you have to have that depth of being able to play domestic players in those competitions, but de depth in general. like To be able to compete week to week in MLS and then also go and get some wins in Open Cup, especially in the early rounds, normally means you're trying out other players and other pieces. I think we saw that with Orlando last year, Red Bulls as well in their runs to the semifinal and then for Orlando to win it. So you need to sort of have that and be able to contend in the playoffs still at the end of the year, the playoff race, while also being able to commit to a semifinal and a final, which are big games. Yeah, it takes a little luck, too. You want to have as many home games as possible, and there's draws to be had there. I'm going to say CONCACAF Champions League is number four on this list. Um, yeah, look, we love CCL. It is super prestigious, uh, at least in our minds, and it's growing in others. You can qualify for the Club World Cup, as the Sounders did. You get that direct head-to-head -head in the history of uh, the Liga MX dominance over Major League Soccer that seems to be sort of turning, but it is established. And so that's why it's number four and League's Cup is number five for me, though I will say, obviously, I see massive growth potential in League's Cup. I just don't think that you can put a brand new tournament over the other ones, uh, even if I do think it's going to steadily rise up that list. Um, 
In the question of what does it take to win CCL, the answer is being Seattle last year, right? It's never happened before, so we don't really have an answer for it. Uh, and Anders is disturbed how low you put League's Cup. I will say this. What's interesting and fun about League's Cup is I think the settings it will be played in versus CCL, which is I'm going to make it as hostile as I can for you off the field. You have to fly to my city. You have to sleep in the hotels. We're going to set off fireworks. We're going to take away all the water and toilet paper from your bathroom. We're going to make the the players uncomfortable, the referees uncomfortable. League's Cup will be more of the pure soccer. So it'll be interesting, the comparison, I think, between those tournaments. Uh, And I think the atmospheres for League's Cup at the later stages when you start to get Tigres and Club America and Chivas fans in the building and it's almost as like neutral sighty potentially as you can be. I think that's going to be really fun, but I agree with you on the history of CCL plus Saprisa won CCL, right? We've seen Honduran teams do well. We've seen clubs from other countries do well. And I think that's what elevates that competition. Well, I'm not shy about saying it. I think league's cup is going to be freaking huge. Like just massive. The fact that both leagues are taking a break, the entertainment is going to be there. I love that. It's every single team from both. So we're going to get, you know, a cross section and, and comparisons that are not just, you know, best of the best Toronto yeah. Tigres. It's going to be everybody that's forced to to sort of measure themselves. And uh, again, you know, it's on MLS season pass on Apple TV. So the, get that subscription. The other part that's nice about League's Cup is, as you were sort of trying to split hairs, is it MLS Cup? Is it Supporter Shield? It's different roster builds for each one. I think if you are a team and it's fair to be built to be a cup competition team, you don't have to wait for the playoffs to start to see your team sort of in their element, right? If you are a fan of, let's talk about teams that make cup runs, Seattle Sounders or Portland Timbers, maybe you're not going to contend for Supporter Shield this year. But if you're built to win MLS Cup, that means you're built to contend in League's Cup as well. So I think it's going to give us a second opportunity to sort of enjoy those styles of teams, enjoy players who elevate themselves at the biggest moment. Maybe Lucas Delarion doesn't bring his A game 34 times in an MLS regular season, but we know he shows up in CCL games. We know he shows up in MLS Cup. So I think that's going to be a really fun element that League's Cup brings, and it's going to add to, okay, this team is built to be a cup contender. They now are higher in our trophy draft at the beginning of the year than maybe they were a year or two ago because there's more opportunities. And also, I think just the fact that with CCL, you got to balance the league. You got to balance early season yeah. with League's Cup. You're, you're not going to have to button do either of those things. It's going to be mid season form, and you're not going to have MLS games to worry about. So I think that is going to be a very, very interesting undercurrent to League's Cup. David Befford said, Give me your Frank Bowley take. He's the new striker that the Timbers signed. Uh, is he the right striker for the Timbers? Probably not. Seems like uh, let's get another roll of the dice in there and see if one of them hits between him, Niashkoda, Aspria. And if Felipe Mora can ever get healthy, it doesn't feel like the w- this is a guarantee signing and it's going to take us over the top. This is a signing Portland's pretty historic with of they just try European experience center forwards whenever they get the opportunity to. Who was the Swedish guy who scored a banger and then went clubbing for the rest of the season? Oh, and, I cannot remember. And they've had other strikers in this category, um, Uruguayans, whatever it is. So This is sort of, I think, for Portland, and they're not wrong. They have the creative player. Oh, Samuel Armenteros. Yeah, legend. Legend in Major League Soccer. Uh, They've got Evander. They've got Santi Moreno. Jimmy Char maybe hurt, but even then, I think I thought Marvin Lurio was good in the last game. Eric Williamson. They just need someone to finish. Give yourself as many options as you can, and whoever gets hot. Whoever, you know, is confident, you just play them. Uh, Dyrone, by the way, out for, I think, four to six weeks right now. That was two weeks ago. So, yeah, Timber's just figuring it out, piecing it together forward. By the way, uh, I didn't know this, but Frank Boley played in 2014 at Stabek. Mm-hmm. Scored 13 goals for Bob Bradley. So, the more you know. The more you know. Diamande uh, Chris- also played for Bob Bradley at Stabek. He went and got him twice. He has not gotten Frank Boley, so I wonder if that sort of shows you where he <laughs> falls in the power did, rankings. Did not think about that. Uh, Christopher Clark hit us up and said, assuming Reynoso doesn't return to Minnesota, how do they rebuild? Do they just find another classic 10 to slot in, or do they update the tactics to mold around the pieces they have and then build from there? It's clear to me how patient they've been with Reynoso that they understand, which I think is what we understand, which is Reynoso is probably of a quality of player that Minnesota cannot find another one of. 
So Emmanuel Reynoso, I don't think he's a player they find another replacement for and continue things on. You have to change the way you play if you're going to lose a, lose a player at that quality. And Doyle has talked about it a couple times on this show. You play two eights, they press higher. You start to get more creativity from the wings. You cover more ground. You're harder to play through in central midfield. There are There's a formula to moving forward. I think FC Dallas would be in that conversation yeah, with agree. three quality center mids rather than one elite player um, that you play through. And I think Minnesota has the potential to do it. I think if Asani Dotson's fully healthy and Robin Ludd is, you already have the building blocks of that. You probably will see them invest in the center forward position again if Reynoso doesn't come back to try and get that elite center forward. Uh, But a lot of, for them this season, I think falls still on Debasi. Like without him, I I, I know they got a shutout in week one, but I'm not confident still about that back line. And that's where a team that doesn't have a Reynoso has to start. Who's the, who's the, uh, the Pachuca center back though to pair with Boxall. Yeah. He played in week one. Yeah, I mean he he's started. fine. So I don't think it's about I don't think it's Debasi. I think it's it's they don't not going to create without Reynoso. Who's it going to be? They don't have wingers that that like do it one v one, and if they're not going to be able to move the ball to create chances, that's that's tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think. I but- think Match day one was a maybe they got the experts didn't know they got the real estate agent tweet out. They fired it off. So it's already a win for the season. You got to, you got to, you you have to. All right. Alex Coy hit us up. Milwaukee sicko here. Just wanted to tell y'all that your golden boot draft inspired me to organize a golden boot league with four of my buddies. This is awesome. The punishment. And this is the best part. The bottom of the table at the end of every month has to pay Everyone else's MLS season pass on Apple TV subscription for that month. So th- these guys were waffling on getting a subscription, but our egos are large enough where none of us think we'll be the worst in the group. So they all subscribed, and now it's you know it's up it's up for grabs. So you're welcome, Apple and MLS, on that one. He said, uh, Alex said they did a five round snake draft. Parentheses, love you, Anders, but your draft logic made no sense. Boom, Anders. Boom. We also expanded the scoring. So their scoring is goals outside the 18, four okay. points. Goals inside the 18, two points, which I don't know about that. Like, I don't know. That affects your draft uh, strategy. And I also like a goal is a goal for me. So I'm not exactly a fan of that necessarily. Plus one bonus for header goals. Interesting. Uh, so you could maybe go to a defender at a certain point. Assists are one point. Successful dribbles, 0.2. Total wow. shots, 0.1. PK miss negative one. And I think PK miss should be more than negative one so that people don't look load up on PK takers and just stack their team with PKs. But oh, that's interesting. So it's a way to even out the weight, which is, does he take penalties? That's right. plus and four And you should goals be punished for missing a PK, I think. Yeah. Should you be punished more if you don't hit anything like Luis Araujo? Yes, that might be where we're at. So I think if it's, if you, if it's a complete like sky ball, Eddie Johnson, U.S. Open Cup PK, then that's minus wow. two. You went for Eddie on that one, not Michael yeah, Bradley. That, yeah, there's plenty that I could go for. I guess <laughs> who was it? Who was it last year in MLS Cup that did the same thing for LAFC? I don't know. I'll remember, I remember. after the show is over. But uh, yeah, I think minus one for a PK save, minus two for just an utter utter miss. This this scoring one, Anders would like it to be stated that they're not a keeper league, so he is in favor of their snake draft. The reason he forced it on us was because of the keeper thing. I don't understand why. Uh, but this does open up the pool of players a lot because you add in a point for an assist, point two for successful dribble. Now you're bringing in wingers. Now you're bringing in creative players. And as you said, if you add bonus points for a headed goal, now you're bringing in set piece finishers and and ba- maybe center backs and stuff like that. It's an interesting one. I like Kai Kamara would be on my list. Too. Oh yeah. Again, you talk about nine goals, seven assists. You're not goals. getting outside the box though. You're getting, but you're getting three for the headers. Who are you getting outside the box from on a guarantee? Zellerayon, maybe. Yeah. Cucho. Bernadeschi. Like that's kind of it. Yeah, Bernadeschi. Maybe, but Bernadeschi is going to be inside the box a lot too, because they need him to be. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if I'd live on that alone. I think I'd load up on the twos and and threes that I could. 
Okay, Derek and Leland Pemberton. You remember we signed them uh, St. Louis City as their team, the father-son duo from Oklahoma. Uh, Derek says, thanks for the team assignment. We were glued to that first game. It definitely went our way. As an ethicist, I was... Our way. Yes. See? Our way. Win. As an ethicist, I was a bit uncomfortable with our second goal. Again, all in. But hey, as long as it benefits us, us, right, we're all good. We are looking forward to the first home game and prepared to, quote, take the highs and the lows. Thanks again. So happy to hear that our team assignment is working out well for Derek and Leland. I hadn't thought about the personality of St. Louis and how the Jared Stroud moment would reminisce in the fan base. I would say this. In theory, St. Louis, Midwest, upstanding, kind. But as anyone who's followed the Cardinals, I was going to make an extent, reference. It fits almost perfectly where they say one thing and then they do another. The best fans in soccer, right here, right? The best supporters in soccer. <laughs> I like how all three of us have never discussed this, and Anders is screaming about the cards right now. <laughs> Oh, Lord. All right. We finished with Ben. Uh, so Ben is he's spreading the good word out here. Guys, I landed from a business trip yesterday to a hilarious text from one friend who is an anti soccer guy. It simply read, quote, yo, how much did you say Quake's tickets cost again? Curious. I responded back, assuming I was being played. Quake's tickets? This is a joke, right? His <laughs> response, quote, well, we had so much fun last year. And since you're going next weekend, we thought we'd join you. Needless to say, my group of three is now five. Uh, I assume they all went to match day one. And I bet you this won't be his last game as we are now exploring season tickets since I'm in San Francisco and he lives in San Jose. Pretty amazing. One end of season Quakes game changed his whole idea of what MLS is and how much fun you can have. This comes off my sister coming with me to the She Believes Cup in Nashville over President's Day. And I just wanted to check out Geodis Park when I visited uh, upon leaving... His sister had purchased three tickets to their oh, opener against NYCFC, and she's attending her second Nashville game and first since the opener against Atlanta in 2020. Uh, funny enough, that trip in 2020 is when I first ever listened to ETR. So he says, the league breeds positivity and community. I've now lived in LA, Dallas, and the Bay Area. And in each city, I have invited friends, and they always want to come back. I may be the sicko, but I had to share that even the sickos have normal friends <laughs> who are becoming, at minimum, MLS fans. Love y'all, and hope you can read this over Tom's Leaf Blower. Ben, that is the Mona Lisa here. That's everything, man. That's what we're going for here. This was kind of one of the things, by the way, because I think Ben has proven, which is the experience in person sells itself. You just have to get people to come. What was tough was, I don't remember who the woman was who emailed us last show who said her husband lives with her in Seattle and comes to games and isn't a fan. And I was like, I don't know where to go from there. No, I don't go to a Seattle game. Yeah. I think he just deals with her fandom, like in and around the house. And she's trying to, she's trying to lock him in. Yeah. Um, But if you go to a Sounders game, I don't know how you don't want to go back. Yeah. With all the bars. If if that doesn't sell you, then we probably don't have much of a chance. Oh, that was some great stuff, Ben. Thank you so much. And, And Ben makes a great point that if anybody out there is thinking about taking a friend, do it. And if you're thinking about telling that friend, they should listen to ETR. Also do it. All right, that's it for us. Mailbags come in uh, very regularly this year with a new cast as well. So be patient. We will get you more news on the studio and the cast in the coming days. But big thanks to Joe Lowry. Thanks to Anders. Thanks to you, Dave. That's it for us. Enjoy the weekend on MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. We'll be back on Monday. Adios.